I can think of no one who is more capable of stretching our horizons in terms of time and in terms of, of uh, geographic perspective than Eric von Kuhner Ledeen, uh, who has lived both far, wide, and he's also lived long. So. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends, uh, due to postal complications, I only knew yesterday, 48 hours ago, I was still in Austria, uh, what I'm going to talk about. In other words, I have sketched for you a lecture, and I do hope that uh, it'll, everything goes right. Now, you know, to begin with, Douglas Gerald, an outstanding British conservative thinker, has said, Europe has become the apostle of her apostasy. And of course, what we say about Europe, we can say about Western civilization. We have given up our real values over a long stretch of time. Don't forget, Western civilization, I repeat here, Mother Yaga, it's not my own brilliant idea, rests on the death of two men, on the death of a philosopher and the death of the Son of God, the death of Socrates and the death of Jesus Christ. A Socrates who was condemned to death, and I'm quite sure you didn't get that in your school, nor did I get it in my school, of course, because he criticized democracy in a purely political trial. And of course, he quoted Homer, he quoted Hesiod against democracy. It was a democratic court. In other words, public opinion condemned him to death. And the same thing happened to our Lord, because there was the howling mob, and our Lord finally was killed. But you see, on these two elements now, in a wider sense, on Greek culture and civilization, and on Christianity with its Jewish roots, rests our Western civilization. And what is the essence of this Western civilization? And I would say the belief in quality. The quality of character, I mean going up to the summit of sanctity, and on the other side of the quality of knowledge and experience and skill. And therefore, do not be surprised if you take Greek civilization, the death of Socrates, his disciple Plato, Plato's disciple Aristotle, all furious, absolutely fanatical enemies of democracy. In other words, the great Western civilization is in its root basically anti-democratic. That is the one fact we have really to face. In other words, this democratic, of course, what me does democracy mean? Democracy really is a political conundrum. It answers the question, who should rule? And the answer it gives is the majority of politically equal citizens, either in person or for the representatives. In other words, equality and majority rule are the essence of it. But you see here, in the majority rule, here is not quality, here is already quantity. And this quantitative revival we get in our Western civilization, finally, in the French Revolution, which has created 200 years characterized by the rule of the G, the rule of the guillotines, the rule of the gallows, the rule of the jails, in the English spelling, uh, the rule of genocide, the gas chambers, and the gulags. If I give you that list in German, it's twice as long. <laughs> So in other words, you see, now Christianity, you see, rests now already a difference from the Greek polystate on personality, on the individual. But I prefer the word person to individual. It comes the word person from uh, a, a, a Etruscan word, from the word fersu, which is the mask of the actor on the stage. In other words, the personality, the role we have to play here in life. And obviously we are all unequal, we said it already before today in various forms, but above all, please don't forget, we are above all unequal in the eyes of God.
Because if we were equal in the eyes of God, needless to say, then Judas Iscariot would be equal to St. John, and then Christianity could close shop. You see, this is theological claptrap, but from that you see to what extent political notions are entering already the theological field. And I know Catholic theologians say, yes, but we equally have bodies, and we equally have souls, and we equally are called, and they're equally and equally and equally all adverbial, and I say then, and John Rockefeller, <laughs> as you can very easily think. But you see, here we come to the whole problem, you know, of left and right. But before I go into that, I must make a little remark about the United States. I have published once a book, in German of course, on the Founding Fathers, and I've studied them carefully, and the inspiration came, which I had, was Jackson Square, right here in Washington DC, where in the middle of Jackson Square, you see mounted on the horse Old Hickory, but in the four corners, the representatives of the European aristocracy, who came over here to fight, not for equality of course, but for freedom, for liberty. Tadeusz Kosciuszko, Baron von Steuben, Comte de Rochambeau, Marquis de Lafayette, and the only general killed, of course, during the American War of Independence. There is no such thing as an American Revolution. I mean, he who knows what the revolution is can only smile. You might make the point that there has been, let us say, a civil war between Whigs and Tories. You might you might go so far, but the American Revolution does not exist. And his only general of the Union killed in this war of independence, Count Pulaski, has his monument in Savannah, Georgia. You see, you must keep that in mind, and that the Founding Fathers, the most bitter enemies of democracy, but the watershed is precisely Old Hickory in the very center. It is 1828, when an alien radically un-American notion from the French Revolution, democracy comes over to this country. And bear in mind, the word democracy appears neither in the Declaration nor in the Constitution. Even the word republic appears neither in the Declaration nor in the Constitution, which merely says the member states of the Union must have a republican constitution. In other words, no Grand Duchy of Delaware, of Delaware or no Kingdom of Texas. But you see, that has to be cleared away. And you see, here lies the enormous tragedy you know, of American foreign policy. And bear here in mind that foreign policy and military affairs, the two great Achilles heels of all democracy, were mere footnotes in the American past. And today, these are questions of do and die. You see, they have become entirely to the foreground. And to deal with them, Democracy is singularly inept, single, especially in the atomic age, if more inept than before. But you see here, we go back just a moment. We have gone now, let's go back again to Europe. Europe is, in, speaking as a European to you, I never became an American citizen. If I had become, I could never make American propaganda in Europe. Well, then I would have to speak as an American citizen. But you see, Europe is an enormously cyclish continent. What has happened in Europe, I, I generalize now very brutally, is that bankrupt democracy of the 1920s and 30s has been restored by the force of arms, by the Western powers under the applause of the Soviet Union in Europe because the Soviet Union has a vested interest in democracy in Western Europe, then you can have, of course, you can have communist parties and in alliances, or maybe single-handed, they might gain majorities, if you ever read Engels. He says the ideal form is a democratic republic for gaining a majority which installs a dictatorship, in his case, the dictatorship of the proletariat. But you see, unfortunately, America has destroyed that fabric, the old day, the traditional European fabric, and has installed democracy. The democracy, of course, became naturally, as Plato has foreseen, became obviously a dictatorship. The so dictatorships have to be destroyed. We went back to democracy in a situation very much like 1815 in France, when the Bourbons, who have been bankrupt, no, no doubt, had been restored by the arms and the bayonets of a victorious alliance. 
But you see now Europe is divided between left and right and the whole Western world and the whole globe between West and right. But West and right must be properly understood. What is left and right? Left is, we are all, leftism is also in us. It is our tie with the animal kingdom. It is this sort of delight in moving among people who are identical or equal or very much alike. The delight in uniformity, and uniformity and equality, of course, are nearly, nearly related. And the rightist outlook is that the delight in the variety of this creation is one of the reasons we travel, because we love to hear foreign sounds and foreign words and eat foreign food and a foreign climate. But you see, all the great dynamic movements of the left are identitarian. The vision of a country with only one class, or only one race, or only one political uh, conviction, that a one-party system, the one, 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 that is the leftist vision. But you see here, of course, this all comes out of the French Revolution, because obviously the National Socialists are the heirs of the French Revolution, an outstanding leftist thinker, Max Horkheimer, wrote in 1939 the French Revolution had finally logically to lead to something like National Socialism. The genocide of the French Revolution to try to exterminate the aristocracy and of course the genocide of the Nazis to exterminate the Jews. I mean, this is the same mentality. He is different. So therefore, out with him, down with him, eliminate him from the scene. But you see, now the next question is, of course, and as, you, as Americans will ask it, as we Europeans ask it too sometimes, but where do we go from here? Uh, this is a very nice uh, uh, looking back into the past. With what sort of great ideas and notions could we try to enthuse the masses of the Western world, not only of the Western world, even of Asia, uh, I'm uh, practically every year now in Japan where I'm doing a similar work as I'm doing in Europe and as I'm doing here in this country. What would be that great idea? And here the answer is, to shock all my nice conservative friends, of course what we need is an ideology of the West, an ideology of freedom, an ideology in which freedom is inbuilt in which freedom is part of the ideology, an ideology which is neither a mere umbrella, nor, of course, a straitjacket, because it would be the end of freedom. See, that is something, we tried that in Portland, Oregon, a group of us with the Portland Declaration, which you probably have seen in the National Review. This is what we need with conservatism, American pattern, we don't get far. What, do, what are you going to do with Burke in Nicaragua and El Salvador? I tell you, absolutely nothing. We have to develop an ideology and an outlook, a common outlook, based, in my opinion, of course, otherwise I couldn't visualize it, in the revealed word of God. In other words, on the theistic foundation. There we could really rouse the masses, if of course it has to come from up down, as socialism has come from up down, this was not a popular movement. These were intellectuals, and intellectuals are terrifying animals, as we all know, but of course we can't get without them. They are nasty creatures, but we need them, the formation of ideas. Because what happened now in the Western world, and has happened, I mean, not only in Europe, and I mean in America the same thing, you have usually two great party groups. You have the Santa Claus parties, usually of the left, and you have the Tighten Your Belt parties, usually from the right. And of course, normally, if we take in consideration what is human nature, well, then, of course, the, the answer is, human nature is, of course, you rather prefer Santa Claus, you don't shoot Santa Claus, as you all know, rather Santa Claus, than the tighten your belt part, this which means sacrifices. In other words, only in extraordinary situations, the tighten your belt parties can win, but I am afraid, I, we see that very clearly in Europe, that on the whole the Santa Claus parties win, and the Tighten Your Belt parties are only interludes. 
In the moment now you have a tighten your belt party and obviously the living standards are going down as they ought to go down. You see, to come back to economic sanity, immediately the voter rebels if you make cuts, especially in the welfare state, or rather I should say in the provider state, which is far more an exact denomination. And then, of course, this is one thing, and then bear in mind also with American, I mean, American conservatism, uh, I should give you a special lecture on conservatism in America, that's a label, and behind that label of conservatism in America, you have, in, you have a whole zoo. You have everybody, as you know very well indeed, you have everybody who's opposed to socialism. You see, and that goes from the anarchic, the unitic fringe uh, to genuine traditionalists on the other hand. With what sort of message will they come to the world? And the answer is, really, they cannot. And of course, you see the Hippocratic traits on the face of democracy in Europe very well, not only on account of the Santa Claus parties, on, on one hand, and the Tighten Your Belt parties, but because you do not find that ne the necessary premises, which Harold Lasky pointed out, are really necessary for a democratic or representative republican regime. And these necessary two premises are a minor and a major, and the minor would be a two-party system. And the major one is a common framework of reference, a common public philosophy, so that the parties are really mere ins and outs. At least they might be apart, but not so far apart that they cannot any longer talk and converse and negotiate with each other or make compromises uh, which are still within the scope of their honesty. And that is the situation in Europe, because Europe is highly individualistic. And here we come to a second thing. The Catholic world is highly individualistic. The world of the Reformation is not communistic, it's communitarian. They have civic feelings which you don't have. I mean, I'm coming from Austin, from a Catholic country. We have no civic sense. Our, our allegiances are primarily the family, and it's the white family. And it used to be, of course, in the old days, the patriarchal system. There was Godfather in heaven, and there was the Holy Father in Rome, and there was the king as the father of the nation, and the father of the king and the family. There were all the fathers patriarchally, and it was a bond of love that worked somehow. That created, after all, and of course, to the reformed countries to a large extent, too. The countries of the Reformation, too. And that created that wonderful, great, with the aid of the church or the churches, great Western civilization. And without the monarchy, and without, I always emphasize it to my American friends, without the monarchy and without the churches, it wouldn't be worthwhile paying a nickel to see Europe. Because as landscape, America is far more grandiose than Europe is. That's our Western, and as, don't forget, these are the roots of your civilization just as well. This is not something separate. But you see, you see the Hippocratic traits. You see the lessening of the people who go to election, of course, not that enormous lessening here in the, as here in America. Because do not forget here one thing, I mean, try to put everything in the right perspective. The great victory of President Reagan in the last election, he was elected of a theoretically electorate by 27%. In Switzerland too, in Switzerland only 55% go and vote, and Switzerland is really a very ancient democracy. Where I come from, don't forget this here, I mean, the American Revolution, entirely new idea. Where I come from, from the Tyrol, we had representative government since 1360 from pre-Columbian days, it's not new, we four states, that was the whole country, of the clergy, of the nobility, of the burger class, and of the peasantry, and they were all equal. They were all equal, all the four things. In other words, uh, the, the imperial cities. There is also, and of course, the ideal form of government, this is not to plead now for absolute monarchy, for heaven's sakes, no. The thing is, of course, that mixed government is the great Western tradition. But what has happened is, of course, already in the 19th century, that it became top-heavy on the demotic side. We need new forms of government. Government of law and order, 
but merely on counting the noses and the preferences of a majority, majority rule has no philosophical and no theological foundation. It is sheer amateurism. It is just volitional currents. Why should? Sometimes the majority can be right, the majority can be wrong, the minority can be right, the minority can be wrong. It is not self-government. Self-government is a paradisiacal and hedonistic notion. In other words, there were people, in the, I've, I've known people who all their life voted and never ever in Europe, their own party had a majority or were in the ruling seat. This is, this is one, of the, uh, one of the curses, I mean, that we are governed by others uh, coming from original sin, which always has to be taken to fall into consideration. So you see, there the Hippocratic, the Hippocratic uh, traits. What we need is, and that should be now to generalize brutally the formula, what we need is minimal government of the highest quality. We must bring quality into government. We must bring experience. We must bring character again. You don't get it through the democratic process. We need minimal government of the highest quality, but what we all get, America or Europe, we get maximal government of the lowest quality. I mean, with enormous bureaucracies, amateurish bureaucracies. You see, I come from a bureaucratic family, my grandfather was high in the civil service, tremendously puritanical, in, curiously enough in Austria in a uniform, I mean, dedicated, to, not permitted to vote, excluded, I mean, uh, any civil servant in politics was out, was absolutely prohibited with the parliamentary system, with the parliament, with elections. But I had army people, all this, you know, the clergy, and of course, and they all were absolutely out. They served their own purposes, you see, in a monastic way. Badly paid, uncorruptible, proud, you can say that, but very flexible, just because they were so sure, you see, of their position, flexible, and for very great flexibility, American bureaucracy can be just like a diamond, you know. I would never try with American bureaucracy to start, to start a little fight. So what we do need is now Europe, we, Europe and America, we must find new forms. Especially, I mean, it sounds very banal, even for, precisely for the atomic age, with uh, sudden decisions to be taken. Just think for a moment of vision. Imagine tomorrow morning at uh, 4.15 a.m., the President of the United States is woken up by three men with dark jackets and dark ties and with a Harvard accent from the State Department and by three men with brass from the Pentagon and say, Mr. President, we have to wake you up because the Russians have done this and during the night and here are the telexes and here are the maps and here's some inside information, we give you 180 seconds to press a button or not to press a button. And then you see all the talks of government by the people, for the people, the president of this president wouldn't do it, but I could imagine President Carter would have tried desperately to ring up Jane Fonda and Walter Cronkite. <laughs> and, the, and the night editors of the New York Times, <laughs> something, something of the sort. See, but it, you see, in other words, we, it is so late in history. You see, what comes after democracy? This is, this is the great question. Because what comes after democracy may be much better. And of course, obviously, it could be infinitely worse. So we have really to try now and to get a real view to put our own house in order to develop new and fresh ideas. And then, of course, obviously, finally, because we spoke about stewardship, to take the stewardship in this globe because Western civilization, whatever happens, Western civilization is going to prevail on this globe. Either genuine Western civilization or the perverted forms of Western civilization. I'm a world traveler in permanence, I can assure you. The, the local ancient Asiatic, and I don't even speak about the younger and fresher African cultures, have no chance of survival. Because we develop technology as Aristotelian cause and effect, rationally thinking people with Cartesian logic, we had to develop 
technology. And you see the impact of technology on Japan, and they assimilate it perfectly well, but are being Europeanized or Americanized or Westernized in the same process. I mean, ours are, but we have developed perverted forms of Western civilization. You see, and they might prevail. We not only have Jesus Christ, and we don't have only Thomas Aquinas, and we don't all, only have the great philosophers, we also have Karl Marx, and we also had Rosenberg, and we also had Hitler, and we also had, of course, Stalin, and we had Lenin, and so on. The question is only which Western form is. Because the West will prevail, and our stewardship and our responsibility, right forms are prevailing. It is very, very late, very late in history, which reminds me of the sayings of Goethe. I give, try to give that to you in, in an English translation. The day has not yet passed away, but our time to act runs short. Soon will the dark night have its way, when every striving comes to naught. Thank you so much. Uh, it is exactly uh, three minutes after one. Uh, lunch was supposed to begin at one, uh, but then again, lunches in these uh, in these circumstances are always at least uh, a few minutes late. So I guess we can uh, uh, we can uh, take a few uh, a few questions. This is too good a panel to to simply uh, uh, let go because it's lunchtime. Uh, let what? I don't know about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me uh, uh, let me make a couple of observations, very short, to focus the questioning. Civilization, ours, like anybody else's, exists in the mind. It is a thing of the mind, and we have seen again and again that it is either animated, fed, or starved by uh, giving to it or denying to it its primary food, and that is uh, the truth. Uh, Dick Allen was absolutely correct in saying that the Congress has the attention span of a six-year-old. Uh, but like a six-year-old, the Congress is very conscious of, uh, of, fundamental, of the fundamental verities uh, surrounding it and is very, very susceptible to leadership. Uh, I recall in 1970, and so does everyone here, I think, in 1977, an article by Richard Pipes in uh, Commentary Magazine called uh, Why the Soviet Union Thinks It Can Win a Nuclear War. Uh, the article was, uh, was denounced as, uh, by, by many, uh, by the ones you would expect, uh, as uh, the, the, the essence of, of, of warmongering. But uh, it was so sensible that it proved to be the basis for uh, arguments in the Congress uh, before men who are not terribly sophisticated, which succeeded in uh, sidetracking the the, uh, the course uh, the, in foreign policy uh, and defense policy upon which the country had been set for some 15 years. Uh, the the verities expressed in that article uh, have have not ceased uh, uh, have not lost their value. As a matter of fact, since the late 70s, the Soviet Union has continued on the pedestrian, but quite sensible strategy that uh, uh, Richard Pipes described. Uh, they are much farther along now than than they were then in uh, building up uh, the the wherewithal for fighting and winning a war against us. This is, uh, this is quite true. What has changed in the past few years? Well, what has changed is that uh, uh, many of us on our side, uh, following the lead, the mistaken lead, the tragically mistaken lead of the Reagan administration, have ceased to, uh, to talk in those terms. Why? Because it is not true? Because those terms are not accurate? Not at all. But because of a preemptive fear 
that uh, we be uh, ill thought of if uh, if we speak this truth. Well, of course, this has proved to be um, uh, not only disastrous from the standpoint of, of, of time lost in countering uh, um, this real uh, military threat, but even more disastrous in the sense that it has uh, made uh, it has made so many. Uh, of those six-year-olds, those powerful six-year-olds, uh, uh, more fractious than they otherwise would be. Um, so, uh, if there's going to be a focus for our brief uh, discussion, uh, perhaps it, it, it ought to be uh, what uh, what things uh, ought we to to be pressing upon the public mind uh, in order to to um, uh, to focus it. Uh, along, uh, uh, along salutary paths. Uh, I am informed by the authorities here, that, that uh, by the absolute authorities here, that the, the rules are for the discussion. Please come to the microphone, uh, identify yourself, uh, uh, and uh, speak. No questions? Right. <laughs> uh, then the, uh, uh, go on. <laughs> My name is Steve Snagoski. I'm a historian with the Department of Education. And I'd specifically like to address this question to Dr. Allen. And this question would be whether he feels that the strategy of containment, uh, defensively oriented, is really sufficient to defend the West. And if it is not, is any more offensively oriented strategy, rollback or liberation, as they were called in the 50s, is anything like that possible today? Well, this is a question that uh, that gets asked uh, a lot, I suppose, in the in the circles of government to the extent that people are thinking about long-range strategies. It's useful to reflect uh, also on the statement of George Shultz of June 15th, which perhaps many people didn't see, in which, on behalf of the United States government, uh, the Secretary of State rejected containment uh, and detente and called for a new strategy uh, that does not yet have a name, but one which would be uh, if you will, more offensive, and I use the word uh, carefully, in nature, one that would carry the battle to the other side, one that would be at least aggressive and, and uh, characterized by a great deal of courage. Uh, one doesn't see any signs of the concrete uh, manifestation of that policy yet, uh, although the statement in itself is probably the, the finest and the most definitive restatement of American foreign policy that I personally have ever seen. I talked to Mr. Schultz about it and urged him to uh, give more speeches in order to acquaint the uh, people with this important shift in doctrine. Uh, I have to repeat myself by saying that there have been no concrete manifestations because I've seen no policy initiatives that give expression to such a, a forward-looking strategy. I am uh, personally much more content if I had to choose with the strategy of containment than I would be of one of detente. I find that detente is a strategy that is intellectually and in every other way bankrupt because it is based on illusions. Uh, and I've never hesitated to attack uh, the, the theory of detente. I think I said in my remarks that in 1980 it was as much a campaign against uh, the Nixon and the Ford administrations as it was against the Carter administration, but the Carter administration had conveniently crystallized most of the, uh, the, the points that needed to be addressed, and obviously one doesn't attack other Republicans in a, in a presidential campaign. In the long run, the United States will have to develop a strategy that will carry part of the battle to the other side. For example, a declaration that we do not acknowledge uh, the boundaries uh, artificially imposed upon us by World War II and some of the agreements therein. Uh, we must develop a strategy that will deal with, the, with what I consider to be the single most important proximate problem, geographically proximate problem, that of Cuba. 
uh, as a result of an inadequate solution to the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962, we, in exchange for some vague promises on the part of the Soviet Union, including the removal of the missiles, that is, to achieve the status quo ante, uh, agreed not to invade Cuba. It was an, a painfully wrong decision at the time, and one for which we are still paying today for having failed to address that particular problem. One of the responses to the uh, shooting down of Korean Airlines 007 uh, could well be a much more uh, uh, aggressively tuned policy in Central America. We can make the Soviet Union pay in Central America in, in many direct and important ways if we're able to muster uh, congressional support or, shall I say, remove congressional micromanagement of the activities of the administration in that respect. So in answer to your question, uh, I, I, I find safety and therefore prefer a in a strategy of containment. I find safety and therefore prefer it. Uh, faced with a choice, I believe we need a new strategy that does indeed carry the battle to the other side, and the strategy that is comprehensive to the extent that it mobilizes support from our allies for sound policy initiatives designed to strangle uh, the, the flow of credit, trade, and technology that passes to the Soviet Union, and for that matter, to the People's Republic of China. Time doesn't permit uh, a to talk about every aspect of this uh, proposed strategy, but I do think the intellectual uh, uh, postulates are there as represented by the Schultz speech. Now the question comes, uh, how do you implement it and where do you get the policies? Who thinks them up? And most importantly, how do you get Reaganauts in place to follow them instead of obstructing them? Next. Yes, uh, my name is Duncan Clark. It strikes me that one of the most effective and, and least costly uh, ways in which some sort of counter strategy against the Soviet Union could be put into place is through the uh, mechanism of broadcasting to the Soviet Union and, of course, uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, basically, uh, it seems that our efforts in this respect uh, have been not only limited in scope, or the old equipment that people talk about, but, but rather unsophisticated in terms of what the peoples in those areas in the Soviet Union really uh, would be interested in hearing. I wonder if anyone could comment on this aspect of the, the war of ideas or the war between the, the two systems. Uh, I think, uh, Professor Niemeyer, would you like to? Uh, would you, uh, yes. Uh, I think this effort to broadcasting to Eastern Europe is immensely important. And I just had 48 hours ago a telephone talk with Jim Buckley, who is the brother of Bill Buckley, and who is the head of Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty in Munich. Just before I took off, we had a talk because we had a meeting and we couldn't, uh, we couldn't finally have it. And I know it from my Soviet Union experiences that there are people practically glued on, very, sometimes in certain areas, very difficult conditions on account of the jamming. But they're living on it, and I never forget a young Ukrainian a student who had been thrown out of the university because he was considered to be a Ukrainian nationalist, and I was absolutely amazed about his thorough knowledge of Western affairs. And where did you get it? All through the radio. And that is, of course, in his case, uh, it's, 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 radio, it's Radio Liberty, which is the Russian language. Radio Free Europe covers all the other European nations. Then, of course, also comes the Voice of America. But the Voice of America is in another category. The Voice of America is a government, uh, is a government agency. The other thing is really largely living by gifts and donations, also by American government support. And Radio the Voice of America is less free and less outspoken. But there is absolutely no doubt that this is very important work. There are areas in Russia, especially in big cities, where they can only hear it about two hours a day, but these are valuable two hours a day. And they are thirsting for information. They are thirsting infinitely more for information than any Western European or American does. So in other words, if you can raise your voice in support of these radio stations, do it by all means. And they are very, they are on the whole very well done. Thank you. I'd like 
Doctor? I would uh, like to point out that in, it was in 1969, in January of 1969, that the United States Information Agency, which is the, the main organ charged with carrying out this work, was removed from the national security process by the then um, assistant to the president for national security affairs whom I served as deputy uh, to whom I with whom I served as deputy and uh, I protested this it was not until January of 1981 I should say that uh, spring of 1981 that the, that the United States Information Agency was restored once again to participation in the National Security Council process and that by uh, only after a long and protracted struggle. Uh, what uh, Dr. Kunert Ledeen has said is absolutely correct, but uh, even this administration has fallen far short of the promises that were inscribed in the platform of 1980 and in the speeches of the candidate. I happen to know a little bit about the platform and the speeches, uh, as some of you may suspect. And uh, the commitment has not been followed through at all. The equipment is archaic. Uh, there are incidentally severe ideological disputes in Radio Liberty and Radio, uh, Radio Liberty uh, itself. Uh, the Voice of America, among other things, transmits national public radio segments. Uh, uh, you know what that means. And uh, every time any uh, attempt is made to, to um, uh, fine tune the content uh, of the of the programming, there is a squeal from the USIA, uh, especially from the Voice of America headquarters, about infringement on the freedom of the press and an attempt to make the Voice of America into a propaganda arm for the United States government. Imagine that. <laughs> that, of course, is the problem, fine-tuning. Uh, bureaucrats uh, are not heroes, and they're usually best attacked head-on. Um, uh, last question, uh, and if you could be kept very short, please, because no. there is a limit uh, to, to forbearance regarding food. <laughs> All right. Uh, Professor M uh, Niemeyer referred to the radical intelligentsia in the United States, and we normally think of intellectuals coming from universities, from the press, and, and so on. Now, what I, I'd like to address uh, this question to the panel, uh, I'm fascinated by the fact that people like Dodd, Sankas, Percy, Matthias, and my congressman from Montgomery County, Mike Barnes, the way in which, uh, and former Senator Clark, the author of the infamous Clark Amendment and so forth, the way in which our representatives have become captured, or the mesalliance which has developed between the intelligentsia and radicalized senators like Dodd and Sangas. And my question would be this, would you consider Dodd and Sangas to be part of the intelligentsia, to have been motivated by the intelligentsia, captured, and so that their positions are articulated by the intelligentsia. How come you get this extraordinary uh, victory of the radical intelligentsia over our congressmen and senators? Are they themselves, would you consider Don Sangas intellectuals or captives of the intelligentsia? <laughs> Congressmen must make speeches regularly, uh, whether they write them themselves or not. They must write laws, whether they compose them themselves or not. To this extent, they are engaged in intellectual activities, in, to, in, in the sense that they are not themselves the originator of ideas, are not particularly critically equipped to examine these ideas for the basic validity and above all have nothing like a metaphysical system as an ultimate standard to that extent yes they are helpless victims in the hands of the radicalized intelligentsia the Delaware suite uh, where lunch will be served is directly to the right Clark and director of the action agency uh, this as an ultimate standard to that extent, yes, they are helpless victims in the hands of the radicalized intelligentsia.